Thank you to our praise team and those who minister in song. As you saw from our choir, that's uh, gotten larger. There's some new folks since we're starting the season again. Uh, after coming back from July break, summer break, uh, there are those who have joined the choir, and a thank you to those who have joined the choir and those who are part of the choir who uh, will be joining us soon again. We're, we're glad. Uh, <laughs> Andy. <laughs> but uh, those of you who would love to get in on this, it's a great time. I, I, I just love to stand up here and call out names, but I won't do that because I want some people to, to come back next week. Right, Kurt? I want some people to come back next week. So, uh, all right, all right. Today is uh, it's got it's an emotional day for a lot of our families, and I'm and I'm serious, entirely serious, because a lot of our parents are sending their kids off to college, and they are moving them in, and uh, some have moved in this week, and or uh, some have moved in are going to be moving in this next week. Uh, but uh, again, please, please keep these folks in prayer. It's, uh, you know, we did it twice, and don't worry, they come back. <laughs> they come back to stay, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, <laughs> but we love it. We love it. We really do love that they come back. And uh, any jobs out there, you know, we... <laughs> But honestly, I know we had several parents sitting along the front this morning, and it was hard, and it is truly hard. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's transition, and it's a different stage of life, and life moves pretty fast, and we, you know, it's hard to catch up sometimes. But there's a good Lord who goes before us, and he smooths the way. And that's what we're going to talk about today. He smooths the way for all of us. So let's bow our heads, and we'll pray, and then let's dig into the Word. Father, Thank you for the love you share in this place. It's real. It's not artificial. It's not made up. It's, uh, it's true. And, it's, and maybe that's why the Spirit's so strong in this place. Uh, actually, the Spirit's here in this place, and maybe that's why our love is so real. And so, Lord, we're thankful that you are in the house, and we're thankful for your word, and we're thankful that you are a God who promises that no matter what stage of life, what transition we're in, that you're a God who's going to see us through and you're going to take us home. And so, Lord, we come back to you today praising you and giving thanks. We know that in this room right now there are folks who are going through stuff of life that only your grace, only by your grace will they get through, Lord. Uh, just to put it bluntly and honestly, it's only through the blessings that come from heaven itself that they're going to make it. And that goes for all of us, really, Lord. Every good blessing that we have, 10,000 and more, come from heaven itself. And therefore, Lord, we are truly thankful and grateful to a God who loves us that, that much, that clearly. And so, Lord, continue to pour it on us. We're going to try to, in this place, continue to be a people who go out these doors and apply what we have learned, apply what we've heard so that it doesn't sit idle, so that it doesn't become stagnant, but it does exactly what your word says it's going to do and that it's going to reap a harvest in so many different directions and ways. And so, Lord, in the next few minutes, you're going to nudge some folks, maybe in ways they've never been nudged before. You're going to call some folks out in ways maybe you've never called people out before. And maybe in this place, Lord, prayerfully, with that nudging and with that calling, there are going to be some folks who say yes to you for the very first time in some different directions. What do you have up your sleeve, Lord? And that's what we're here to find out. So may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's family said, amen. Erwin McManus is the pastor of Mosaic Church in, in L.A. And he tells the story of receiving news through the grapevine that he was dead. Uh, that's right, that he was dead. Uh, the fact was, he wasn't dead, but because he had led the wife of a murderer to Christ while the murderer was in jail, the murderer had heard about it, he had passed it down through the lines, and he had, the message had come to the preacher, to Erwin McManus, that when I get out, you're a dead man. You're a dead man. The guy's name was William, and... Uh, his reputation preceded him. He boasted about breaking all of the commandments, and he was in jail this time for slitting a man's throat and killing him. And so when he re was released from prison, Erwin McManus said, I had this strange nudging that had to be from God. 
He said, because I would not have wanted it, and I would not have thought of it. But the nudging was, before William finds me, let me find William. And so this pastor hunted William down. And he found him in a rundown apartment in a dingy part of L.A. And the apartment was full of screaming kids and drunk neighbors. And as Irwin walks into that apartment and up those stairs to that room, he notices that the kids run out the door, and he notices that the drunk neighbors close and slam their doors. And what he finds is he's in a room with William alone. It was in that moment that William reached into his pocket and pulled out a knife. He opens up the knife, and he holds it in front of him, in front of the preacher, and he says to Erwin McManus, he says, this is the knife I slit the man's throat with. The police never found it. It was in that moment that Irwin said he realized what he said next better be on cue and on point because it might be his last sentence. So it had to be important. And so he said this. Out of the preacher's mouth came these words. William, that knife is going to send you to hell. Herwin McManus said that as soon as those words left his mouth, his brain started thinking, where did that come from? Where did that come from? But then he figured that since he was still alive, he would proceed. And so he said, William, you're tough. And I know you're tough. But you're not free. Yeah, you're out of prison, but you're still a prisoner. Because behind every shadow is someone waiting to kill you. And as he continued, Erwin McManus said something strange and something spiritual happened. All of a sudden, he saw that face of that murder change. And the countenance change. And the spirit change. And all of a sudden, he, he stood in front of a man who was actually listening to what he was saying. And the guy started to relax, even. And then, as Erwin continued, he listened to the point where a strange friendship began that day between a murderer and a preacher. Now, even though William never came to Christ, hasn't yet, he learned to respect this preacher, and in his words, here's why he respected the preacher. For being just as radical for God as William, he was radical for evil. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to turn to Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 14. Because what we're getting ready to step into is exactly what I prayed a while ago. And that is before the next few minutes are over with, I truly believe God is going to call some of you out. He's got some of you in his target right now. He's looking at you and he has nudged you and he has spoken to you over and over and over again. It's been interesting during this series that we've just been at it, what, three weeks? And already three different people have come up to me and said, you know, David, I always felt God moving in my direction to call me out into this or that or this, and now I'm going. Well, I hope and pray today's the day for you. But what I want you to know before you take that first step and you jump out of the boat and you stand on the water is it doesn't come risk-free. Following Jesus Christ is not risk-free, and it's not always guaranteed safety in this life for doing so. And I want you to hear it. Last week, we talked about the power of influence and how Jonathan influenced that armor bearer to come and follow him. And in the weeks to come, you're going to see how it influenced the whole nation of Israel. Today, we go a step in another direction, and that is, yes, you can be influenced, and yes, you can hear the call of God, but it's never a step into complete, here's safety and security, here's what's going to happen, here's the ease. Now, it's a wonderful thing. God, God truly goes before us. It, that's what the Word says, is that many times, and, and here's my prayer for you guys during the week. Here's a regular prayer that I pray for this congregation, for my church family here in this place, for you. And that is, before you go to work, before you go out of your home, before you go into the neighborhood, before you go shopping, before you go to school, that God will go before you and smooth the way. 
Now, when you hear that, don't, don't go overboard, okay? Because sometimes when you go overboard, you think, if God's going to go before me and smooth the way, everything is going to be rosy. Everything's going to be smooth. Not the case, right? Not the case. But here's the deal. If God goes before you, then some of the rough places are going to be smoothed out. And so it's not going to be as rough for you as if God didn't go before you. This is what Jonathan found out. And this is what you'll find out as we go through this today. The fact of the matter is, if it's truly a God thing and if God's in it, it's never without risk. It won't be easy. It may be far from safe. Let me go on and tell you, and many church folks already know this, if it's from God and you're called to do this, you're going to have critics. You're going to have people who ridicule you. You're going to have people who say, no, you can't get it done. No, you shouldn't do it this way. No, you, and, and go on and on. It may even involve failing several times before you get it right. And so we come to 1 Samuel chapter 14. For those of you who are newer to us, let's go on and, and update, summarize the story. Let's read it from verse 1, chapter 14, 1 Samuel. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come, let's go over the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Who's his father? Class, who's his father? King Saul, you got it. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree. Okay, that, it's, it's sort of like, we'll come back to this one too. It's sort of like Saul is comfortable. He is secure. Remember, he's over the hill. The Philistines are over here. Here's this valley. He's looking over here. He's sitting under in the shade. It's probably a hot day. And he's thinking, I don't need to move just yet. Let's just say where we are. All right. And so he's under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli. That's why I go to seminary, so I can learn this and just to mumble over this, and you think it's real. And so anyway, <laughs> you hear another preacher and say, that's not the way David pronounced it. Okay. There's, that's, that's, there's a reason for that. Uh, okay, Eliah, or Eli, I'm sorry, Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. Okay, it gets a little easier now. All right, verse 4. On each side of the pass, remember each side of this little valley here, that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozhez, the other Senek. One cliff stood to the north of Michmash, the other to the south towards Greensboro. Okay. <laughs> Whatever, okay. <laughs> That's not the important stuff. Here's the important stuff. <laughs> Jonathan said to, and you pay me to do this. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Again, he gets personal there. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. In verse 7, Here's what we looked at last week. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. This was influence. This is what we said last week. You, you know, it's different than authority. You've got somebody, heart and soul. you got it down to the, to the core of who they are. They will back you, okay? And here's what we add today. Jonathan said, come then. We will cross over towards the men and let them see us. If they say to us, now here's the strategy. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you. We will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Now, what you're noticing about Jonathan is he's sort of radical here. He's the guy who has said, William's just gotten out of jail and, and, and I'm not going to wait for William to find me. I'll go to William Jonathan is the one who's standing over here looking at the Philistine, and he said, I'm not going to wait for the Philistines to cross the valley and come to us. I'm going to the Philistines. That's what he's, what he's doing here. Now, this is just one more example where we've talked about this before. If God nudges you to do something, he doesn't always lay out every detail of the plan. Many times it's a step-by-step -step thing. It's you going through the process of trusting in God, you putting your foot out of the boat and standing on the water and waiting for God to say, okay, here's the next move I want you to make. All right, so Jonathan is finding that out. But here's also the second thing we got to notice is this is a risky plan. I mean, notice again, verse 8. Come then, we will cross over towards the men and let them see us. <laughs> Come on. 
You know, I've never been to West Point. I've never served in the military, but here's what David would probably do. I, I wouldn't cross over by myself with just an armor bearer. That's for one thing. But if I did, it would not be let's show our faces and let them see us, all right? It would be let's, let's maintain strict, you know, uh, radio silence. Let's, let's go undercover, under the radar. Let's hide in the bushes, all right? And then hopefully at some point somebody will see us and come help. I mean, they're outnumbered. They're out-equipped. They are outmanned. You just don't go announce yourself to the world that you're about to attack, all right? But Jonathan did. So why? Why would he do that? Well, there's an easy answer. It's because Jonathan knew something that dad didn't know. Or dad may have known, but he didn't really live on. And that was where God leads, he proceeds. Where God guides, he provides. Where God has said you will have the victory, you do not have to second guess no matter how many are with you or not. God will come through. Church, you and I don't create God moments on our own. They are opportunities given to us by God. And Jonathan is seizing this divine moment and he says, here's a radical plan because this radical God is in it and he's told us we're going to win. Therefore, if somebody else is in the equation, if it's a God moment, the somebody else is God. If somebody else is in the equation asking you, nudging you, calling you, saying go and I'll be there, then that most likely is God saying here, let my spirit move. If we're faithful and we take the risk to seize those divine moments, then here's the truth. He'll carry more of the workload than you ever will. He'll go before you. He'll carry that workload. read a great story in my devotions last night. Uh, this lady who had six children and her husband was in his late 30s and he died suddenly. She's left with six children to raise by herself. And she raised them. And she did a fantastic job. All of them turned out to be godly men and women. And so towards the end of her life, uh, these reporters got news of the story. They wanted to interview her, sent a, sent a reporter over. And the reporter asked the question, how did you do it? You know, and I guess probably through depression and, and, and through the depression times and early on and six kids, how did you do it? She said to the reporter, she said, I made a deal with the Almighty. He and I negotiated. And the reporter said, what was the deal? And she said, I prayed one day, Almighty God, you take care of the worrying, I'll take care of the work. In other words, I'm throwing this on you, Lord. You do the concern. You do the worrying for me. I'll do the work. And until you tell me differently, I'm going to keep on. I'm just going to keep on. You know, are there areas in your life right now where God is saying, here's what I want you to do. Here's where I want you to stand. Here's where I want you to go. Here's where I want you to give. Here's where I want you to serve. And he's waiting for you to look at him and say, all right, Lord, you do the worrying. You figure it out. I'll do the work. I'll put my foot out of the boat and I will go. Where is it that God in your life is telling you right now, stand up, show yourself to the world, show yourself, stop hiding, you know, stop hiding, but get busy. All right, I'll come back to that. The story goes on in verse 11 to say this. So both of them, Jonathan and the armor bearer, they have crossed the pass here, the valley here. They have climbed up the cliff. They are showing themselves. Actually, they're not quite to the cliff top. They're showing themselves at the bottom here. And so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Now, this was the point of no return. All right, this was the point of no return. Uh, divine moments require us to stand up and make ourselves known. At some point, when God calls you out, He says, I want you to stand up and present yourself to the world. Stop hiding. You can no longer hide. Maybe that's one reason that Jesus said, you know, when you come to faith in Christ, you do it publicly. You stand up before people. You don't hide something like that. You stand up and make yourselves known. That's what happens through baptism as well. You're making yourself known in that. You know, I got to think, who are the people who never seize divine moments? Who are the people, and churches you could say as well, who are made up of these people, who never seem to do really anything cool for the kingdom? 
who never do anything fantastic, do anything different. Who are the people who are still, remember, we got the Israelite army, a good number of them, hiding over here in the caves, in the woods, in the hills. And they're watching as these two little dots go across this valley, and they're seeing what's happening. Oh, wait till next week. It gets good. But who are the people who continue to hide? They're the people who hear God saying, who will take a stand on my behalf? And they shrink back in the shadows. It's all about the oceans that we sang a while ago. It's those who don't trust the God to lead them through that. Well, let me ask you, church. Is there one person in Scripture, just one, name me one, who did something earth-shattering for the kingdom of God, who didn't take risk, and who didn't pay some price, and who didn't take some ridicule, and who it was all just safe and secure for him? Name me just one. There is not one. There is not one person in Scripture you can find. The fact is, the most important eternal things you will ever do for the kingdom of God will require you to come out of hiding and show yourself. To finally get up off your seats and move into action. To get out from under the pomegranate trees and to go across the field of service. God has given me a little bit more of the vision for this church recently. And I'm going to say it's from God because I wouldn't be pulling this one. And here's the vision. Already we are seeing a lot of different folks move off into a lot of different directions in missions. Now you know me. Missions can occur in Tanzania, Liberia, Honduras, Haiti. Missions can occur in Salisbury, in Concord, in Charlotte, in Greensboro, in your backyard, in your neighborhood. The vision is this. Right now, right this minute, God is calling some of you to do something you've never done before. And there is something inside of you that is twinging and twisting when you hear Mary Hurd speak or you you see some folks like Elizabeth or Lauren come back from a trip or a Honduras team or you see a Habitat crew go out and do their thing like Dana and Tony and Dennis do every week or you see a cooking team. There is a twitching going on in you and some of you and some of you have sat on it. You sat on it. This church has done some fantastic kingdom building in the last several years. But what if, what if every one of the 600 folks who call this place home really got off their seats and out from under the pomegranate tree? What more can we do, folks? You see, it's more than just sitting back and feeling sorry for somebody. It's actually doing something about it. It's more than ridiculing somebody who's down and out and they can't, they can't, you know, they can't, they can't make it. It's actually seeing what are their needs. How can I lift them out of this? How can I help them with this? It's one thing to feel sorry. It's one thing, it's one thing to say, hey, you can hold a gun to my head and I'll never deny Christ. It's another thing to have the gun held to your hand, to your head. Many of you remember the story of Jim Elliott. How many of you remember, know the story of Jim Elliott? And his wife, Elizabeth Elliott. Uh, but Jim Elliott was a missionary to Ecuador back in the 50s. He was in his late 20s, I believe. And um, Jim went to Ecuador to share Christ with the natives. He lands his plane. And when he lands his plane, he, some of the natives come out. And uh, he actually, it was a water plane, and so he actually took one of the natives up into the air and, for the very first time. But he came back down, and I think there were two other men with him, I believe. But the natives came out, and they speared them to death. The natives that they went to share Christ with killed them. All right? Now, the wonderful thing about that story is that his wife, Elizabeth, as well as his son, they go back later, and uh, they basically, I'm, I'm thinking as the story goes, I've seen the movie and I've read the story, they, they helped lead these same people who killed Jim Elliott to Christ later. But Jim Elliott wrote this. I want to see where it hits with you. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. 
to stepping out of the boat and doing something for the kingdom of God require risk? Yes. Is it all safety and fun and games here on this life? No, not necessarily so. But will you gain much more than you ever give up? Yes. That's the answer. And that's why this church has moved so in the last where, however many years. Even before I came, it was moving in the right directions. It's because somehow, some way, church leaders decided and a church family decided it's worth the risk. Let's try it and see if God's in it. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful. Look, look back at Jonathan's sort of strategy, strategy here. See, strategy. It's like this. You know, if they say, come to us, we'll climb up because that will be our sign. The Lord has given them into our hands. And I'm sure the armor bearer was thinking to them, but what if they don't say this? Then we run, okay? But basically what they're saying is let's step out and see if God's in this thing. If he blesses or not. And we have over and over, church family, haven't we seen God blessing over and over when we stepped out and did something a little bit different, a little bit crazy in some eyes? God continues to do that. You see, the cost is huge for taking risk, but the rewards are greater. The rewards are greater for those who are willing to say to God, I am not willing to sit under the pomegranate tree any longer. I'm moving. Jesus knew that when he went to the cross. For you. I love that scripture that says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Come again. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What joy? Nails going through your skin, bleeding to death. Basically, no breath in your body. Where's the joy? That's not what the scripture's saying. The joy for Jesus that helped him to endure the cross was looking at you guys and looking at all of you and all of you and all of you and even the back row folks, you know, and saying that here's the joy for Jesus. One day, because of what I'm doing, they're going to be in heaven with me forever. One day, I get to live with them forever. Jesus says, yes, the cost is great, but the rewards are greater. The reward for all of us to risk in this life is knowing that you will never surrender, you will never give up, you will never sacrifice more than what God will give you in return. Point blank. You'll never outgive God. You'll never outgive God. But the only way you're going to learn to do it is to take the risk, to try it. And some of you are right on the edge. Some of you are ready to get up and go. But something just continues to hold you back. The what ifs. Let me ask you to put the what ifs aside and use some God moments to get busy for him. Back in 2003, Dawn and I had the awesome occasion sent by this church to head to Europe and to travel with another group of pastors and uh, folks to minister to military bases or at military bases, especially in Garmisch, Germany, where a lot of those who were serving would come for retreats and they would hold these church conferences. And one day, uh, we're traveling from Garmisch, Germany to Interlaken, uh, Interlaken, Switzerland. And we were hopping seven trains in that one day. You know, there were, there were times before that I always wanted to ride a train. I have never since then wanted to ride a train. And uh, it's like... It's like we were, we came to that last part of the day, and we get on board this last train uh, in Switzerland, or heading towards Switzerland. And it's kind of weird. Uh, if you know anything about the Swiss Army, is it's sort of a, 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 a weekday army. Is They are full of young people. Young people get out of school. They go into military service for a time. And... Uh, they get out of, they, what they'll do is they'll go home for the weekends, they'll get on the train Sunday night, go back to base, then on Fridays they're coming back home again. So it's, you know, that's, that's Swiss Army for you, okay? We get on this train, and it is, honestly, the car is from here to those double doors back there. And we're looking down the center aisle, and the center aisle was about half of what that center aisle is. And there are all these people dressed the same way, and we suddenly realize pretty quickly 
This is the Swiss Army on the move, all right? All these young people who they were cutting up and they, were, they had their legs straddled, you know, out in the aisles and everything. They're no, they know we're tourists, you know, we look the type and we're coming down, we're carrying our bags or rolling them behind us and they're trying to trip us, okay? They're, they're having their fun and they're trying to trip us. It's the end of a long day, we just want to get a seat and get to our beds, all right? And we're heading down the, the, the end of the car, and, and, and the others had already gone past me. I think I was hauling all the luggage. So anyway, <laughs> felt that way. But I noticed as I get towards the end, on the left side, there was one soldier sitting by himself. And these are cars, and many of you know the type of European cars where you sit facing one another. Okay, there are two seats, and you're facing one another. And uh, so the seat in front of him was empty. And so as everybody went through the double doors, I, I stopped, and I said, could I sit down here? And uh, he said, yes. And so I sat down, and after a few minutes, uh, him looking at me and me looking at him, we struck up a conversation, introduced ourselves. His name was Rolf, and uh, he broke into one of the songs from Sound of Music or something like that, but uh, <laughs> he was just there. No, okay, I'm just seeing if you're with me. I'm like that. I'm sorry. Visitors, hope you come back next Sunday. But anyway... <laughs> but his name was Rolf. And so Rolf and I started talking amongst, and he was very interested in the first part of the conversation to learn what it was like, life in America was like. And he was very interested as a military guy. He was one of the officers, and thus sitting by himself, he was very interested in wanting to know, you know, why do Americans do this and do this with their politics? And, and he was going in that direction. And so we talked for almost an hour with regards to that. And all the time I'm thinking to myself, okay, Lord, you did not allow this empty seat for no reason at all. You gave me this opportunity. Don't let me flub it because I'm good at that. Don't let me mess up. So I'm, he's sitting there talking to me and I'm praying. Okay. That's why I have a deer in the headlights with you a lot of times. You're talking to me and I'm just praying. And so, and praying for you, of course. But anyway, and I'm praying, Lord, for this opportunity and let me see the open door. And so we go on in the conversation over and over again and the transition comes. The transition comes in this way. He's sitting there and he says, what brings you to Europe? <laughs> and I said, thank you, Lord. And I start to tell him about our, our ministry to the military, about how these guys and gals are away from home and they're away from church and we get to come and we get to see to their spiritual needs. We get to pray with them. We get to counsel with them and we get to preach and, you know, talk to them in that way. And uh, he looks at me just straight on and not smiling. He says, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. And he told me about being born in a Catholic family and about how church life was boring and how the only ones who go to church in Switzerland uh, or a greater part of Europe as well are what he called kids and gray hairs. All right, that's how he described the older folks. And so I asked him how he had come to the point of not believing in God. And he goes through this very humanistic view of God's invisible and what, how, how can you trust in something you can't see and man controls his destiny and on and on and on. We went with that conversation. And I just kept praying, Lord, when he takes a breath, let me be ready. And he ended that little conversation with this, this sentence. He said, our country is going down because there are no longer any values holding it together. And when he said that, I said, thank you, Lord, open door. And I said, Rolf, there is an answer. And that answer is Jesus Christ. And he's the answer for your country and my country and for you and for me. He's the only hope we have. And I said, Rolf, I don't have a lot of time, but let me share with you several things. And for the next few minutes, God allowed me the opportunity to share Jesus Christ, to share the gospel with this guy. He allowed me to present the gospel, what it meant to me, what it means to people who, who believe, and how he can receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. In fact, I took out a little business card, and I turned it over, and I drew what, uh, you know, that, what we do in Contagious Christian. We learn a little uh, drawing about the, uh, the, the um, separation of God from us, and we're on one side, God's on the other, and there's this chasm or chasm or I never learned it's a canyon it's a hole there in the middle 
And it's God, it's Jesus Christ that brings us from one to the other. And he, he, he takes away the separation. So I drew that little thing out for him. And I have, I have done my best. You know, we've done it in, with the military. So we, were, we had practice. And I actually did this with Ralph. I said, Ralph, this is something we've been doing with the military. Could I use it on you? And he said, sure, do it. And so I drew it out for him. And just as Billy Graham's getting ready for the invitation, you know, just as David's getting ready to, to lay in with the literature, he, the train stops. And I, I don't know how many of you have traveled in Europe, but when a train stops, you have about 30 seconds to get off that thing. Yeah, they're not going to wait. And I did not want to end up in another country. So I said, I got up, I said, Rolf, I've got to get out of here. But I want you to know, here's what you have heard. Think about it, and I'm going to pray for you tonight that God is going to show you the truth. And this guy who could have said anything or nothing at all looks up at me and says, I want to thank you so much. Now, that might not be a big foot in the door, a big uh, crack there for you, but for me, it was huge. You know, I'm honest, I, I don't know. I can't say he came to Christ. You know, I don't know if he thought about it that night and prayed about it and, and asked God into his heart. I would love to think of the day when we get to heaven and he comes up to me and shows himself as having said yes. But here's the truth. If I had refused to step up and show myself in the sharing of my faith, no seed would have been planted in Rolf's mind or heart. Absolutely none. And Rolf may never have been open to hearing the truth. Now, I would love to say as your preacher, being paid for what I do oftentimes, that I don't ever let a time like this slip by. But I do. There are many times I would much rather sit under the pecan tree or the oak tree or whatever tree and just take it easy safe and secure then cross that valley and show myself to the world but there have been some times in my life where I've gotten it right and those times are times that I can look back and say thank you God thank you that even the blessings the rewards were far greater than anything I ever was called to give up or to sacrifice where are you this morning Honestly, where are you? Some of you have sat under teaching so long. It's like one preacher said, you don't need a Bible, another Bible study. You don't need another sermon. You just need to get up and apply what you know to be truth. Some of you, I'll be honest with you, I'm looking out at you and your name is on a church roll, but we don't see you involved. We don't see you involved. And for this church to continue moving in the way God wants us to move, he wants 100% involvement. And that's speaking to David too. So where are you? I want you to use the next five minutes for personal worship. We're going to do something a little different here. You're just going to see a song that we have sung before over and over again. But I want you to use it as words that truly try to sink into the heart. Try to truly sink into the heart. I might bring you into it at some point. But I just want you to sit. And I want you to take it in. And this time, I want you to take it in knowing the story behind it. The song we're about to sing is, or hear, is when it's all been said and done. In other words, when I get to the end of my life and the preacher's laying me out with a eulogy or whatever, when it's all been said and done, have I truly given exactly what God called me to give? When he nudged, did I go? It comes from a group out of Northern Ireland. Uh, Robin Mark wrote it, but it comes with the, uh, the, the, the background is this, that there is a lot of persecution going on amongst Christians in, 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 in Northern Ireland, even still to this day. And the songs they sing come out of believing in a part of a world that it's tough to be a believer. In fact, one pastor noted recently that his greatest concern for his church family was to get his little boys and girls to church without them being shot on a Sunday morning. So again, we can't fathom what other believers are up against. But it's in this area of Ireland that God is sparking revival and has for the last decade in spite of terrific obstacles. Folks are making the most of God moments. And one of the songs that has inspired these people to do so is the one we sing and you're about to hear when it's all been said and done. But here's what I want you to do. Because these words could have been Jonathan's words when he showed himself to the Philistines, to a God who knew he knew was going to give and could give. As you hear these words, make them your own. And ask throughout this song 
God, what are you up to in my life? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to be about? Can I give you just one, one quick story? I'm looking over here at Jennifer and the women's conference last weekend. Got a text and email from a lady who was at the conference this weekend. She lives up in Davidson County, I guess. But she heard about the Bible teaching that goes on. It doesn't happen in, in everywhere uh, in other counties. She, she wants to be the one to take it to Davidson County because she was here. Golly, guys, just because we open the doors, maybe Bible can start to be taught in the public schools in another county. That's huge. Somebody wants to take the God moment. What's God saying to you right now, personally? It, it ain't what David looks at you and says you ought to be doing. Don't get, don't get that. I could sign every one of you up for a cooking team, all right, and be very happy and sleep very well tonight, but I'm not going to do that. What's God saying to you? What's he saying to you? So, as you listen to these songs, if you're another Rolf, if it's time for you to commit, do so. And if you're here today never having surrendered your life to a God who loves you more than you can ever know, then why not use this time to give him a chance? Invite him into your heart and life. I'm going to be standing up here, and as these words are being sung, you just listen. I'm standing. If there's a decision that needs to be made that I can help pray you through, I'm here for you. And then we'll sing together towards the end. Go ahead if you guys would. Thank you. Let's worship.